Okay, my name is Daniel Guise. I'm the Creative and Technical Director at ED Films. I just, I'm going to just hop right into this because I'm not really expecting anyone to be online today, mostly um, because it is Easter Sunday and most people aren't around today. Um, I think I'm just having a little bit of trouble getting my desktop working. Okay, here we go. All right, so there we go, fading away. So I just wanted to, I've been working on this this forest scene for an opening shot, well, not an opening shot, for a shot in this film we're doing, uh, Let There Be Light, which is already screening. So it's screening without a couple shots in. And I'm just, I've been in the process of building up the composite for the scene using all these painted assets that I made. And so um, it's it's been a pretty elaborate process. It's taken me a while. I still haven't done my color correction on of it on any of it but um, I think I've got the basic layout done now it looks a mess like it looks it looks awful um, but that's because there's no depth in this yet this is strictly all the the components brought together all the different pieces to create the general layout of what's happening now, it feels really busy right now it's a big old dirty mess but once I get the atmosphere and the general lighting under control things should come together so you can see there's a lot of depth. So the main goal here in this first pass is to assess the depth and get everything laid in so that there's a there's a general sense of lushness in the forest and that the layers all feel like they're contributing to the to the to the volume of the scene. Um forgetting to put my camera on. There we go. Okay, so I also did a couple little tricks here for any little anything that's close. So I'm just going to stream this really quickly. I probably won't stream too long on this because um, I just want to do a quick overview. And I'm adding a little detail, which I just figured out, which I'd like to share. So on this foreground layer, you can barely tell right now when we move in, move past it. But on some of the trees so that they don't feel so super flat, like this one here, is what I did is I actually duplicated this layer and pulled it forward a little bit. So if I just parent it to this layer, let's have a look at their position. It's negative 120, let's put it at negative 120 off of this, and I scaled it up a little bit. So it's 110% bigger. So what that does is that gives, I'm just basically copied this front piece and brought it forward and then added a feathered mask to it. So you can see I've got this feathered mask. And what that does is just create, it creates one more piece that will help flesh out the depth of this object. So if we look at it, so let's go here, go here. And I mean, I, I can do this to more trees. I'm only going to do it to the really f the foreground trees. It's really, really, really subtle, but it is there, it is noticeable. Um, you may not notice it that much, but it does make a tiny difference. I'm all about tiny differences to the overall feel of the tree. I could pull it a little bit closer if we want to exaggerate that some more. I just have to make sure that the scale isn't so different that... So you see how it's giving that sense of there's more to the tree. Um, there's just the slightest bit of sh parallax shift happening in the front of the tree. And that's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So I don't want it so much that it actually... We really feel it. I just want a subtle amount. I mean, you could go a little bit further with this and do one more, which may be a bit absurd, but let's just do it for fun. So this one will be negative 200, or let's go negative 225. So you see that, and then what we'll do is we could do two things. We could take the, re repaint the mask, or we could just uh, take the mask's expansion and reduce that. So that'll crop that in a little bit. Now the reason we we have to make sure that we scale this up, because if we don't, we'll see the re repeating pattern as we shift off the parallax. So we'll see the same shape. So if you can see, it's kind of hard to see because it's so dark. But let's just move in a little bit. So the camera is more to the left here. So what you're going to see is the repeating pattern. You see how that we're getting the same shapes happening? It creates a sense of repetition, like a stamping, we want to avoid that, right? So if if we don't want that to happen, the best thing to do is scale it up enough so that it's it's kind of its own thing. Now, we don't have to scale in the Y so much as scale in the Z, or sorry, on the X, and also let me center it more to this here. 
or more where our camera is, and we'll we'll scale it here. This will just make sure help us ensure that what we're seeing is wide enough to block out any repetition that we might get. And it continues to bring more depth to that tree. Just a bit. Just enough to, I mean, it's probably, maybe it's possibly too much. I don't know. Let's just do negative 200. I just, it's just something to add something. See that? It feels rounder. And for me, that's the point of a lot of this stuff is to just fake that 3D just enough so that it feels like something. Okay. So that's all part of this big tree. So we'll just color those all the same and make sure they're parented to the one tree, which is great. Okay, so that's done. So the next thing I did is um, the next big step in creating depth is is atmosphere. And so to create atmosphere in the scene, I've created a little a little piece of code. I don't even know if I don't know if I'm doing it right, but essentially it's just a, a pretty basic expression. And what I'm using is I have a null object which I'll have at the top of the scene. We'll call this tint. And this tint object will actually help. This drives a tint controller in the whole environment. So this will be, this is like a fog generator essentially, or an atmosphere generator. So I have tint, and I have my light and my dark. And I'm using a tint instead of a, a fill because I want to possibly be able to control my light and dark. For now, I've just put it white. And so then I have these sliders for a near value, a far value, and an intensity value. And that's what I'm going to use to control the fog levels. So then, for anyone who's watching, um, I'm going to show you the code that I made. And now, like, I'm not an expert at coding whatsoever, so this could be total garbage. But it's just the most linear, um, I guess, artist code ever. But what happened? What I've done is I've just I've made a variable for, and I make variables just to make things a little bit easier to wrap my head around. It's not so much that they're necessary. I, I could just grab the values and, and stick them all in a big line. But it's more for me to wrap my head around the logic. So I've, gra I've created a cam Z position. And that variable, that's just grabbing the Z position of the camera. And then I have a Z position, which is the, the, the Z position of this layer. Excuse me. Because what we want to keep track of is how far away or how close these objects are together, the camera and the the distant object. And that's to create that fog. Like fog lives in sort of this range, right? So as we get closer to objects, the effect of the atmosphere thins out. As they get further away, it gets thicker. But there is a point where it's so thick we don't see a difference anymore. And that's what I'm kind of calling the near and far. It's pretty standard terminology for, for fog or for even depth of field. So my near is the point I want the fog to start kicking in. My far is where I want the fog to be at 100%, which would be the tint. So the tint is going to drive any object to full white at 100%. Okay. So basically what I've done is just to make simplify this in my own brain, I grab the camera Z position, and then I grab the Z position of the, of the object that we're referring to, so the layer that the tint is applied to. And that's just to simplify my variables. And then I create a new variable called dist, DIST, which is for distance. So now I'm, I'm just, I want to basically figure out how far apart these objects are. So I take the Z position and I subtract the camera Z position. It's important to subtract the camera Z position second because, especially if you're dealing with a typical After Effects scene, is your camera is always in the negative Z space. It starts there. It'll eventually move in the positive, but it usually starts in the negative. And so you have to get a negative minus a negative to make a positive, right? So if Z position of this layer is 1,000, or is that 0? Zero, 0 minus negative 3,004 equals 3,004. One of the other things I do while I'm creating something like this um, is I create another slider. This is something I've been doing recently. I'll create a slider. And I just call it value. And I'll actually do the code in here instead of on the actual effect. And the reason I do that is that I can actually see the number. So if I take this code, I'm just going to paste it in here. Before I figure everything out, I can literally go through each step of the code as I'm building it. 
So let's just take off. Um, we'll just take this off, and we'll put fog range is near minus far. So, or far minus near. So I can see that value right there as I'm building the code up. So each time I go through something, so right now the last line is essentially what this slider is going to equal. I can see that it's reading my values, and I can see what I'm getting. So as I'm, as I'm building this up, I can see that my numbers are right. Because right now, if I was just to work with the, with the filter, um, with the effect, it only has a range of zero, it's a percentage range, so it's going to be zero between zero and 100. So I can't necessarily see what my numbers are actually doing. So here I can see what my numbers are actually doing. So I, by putting my code in this value, I can watch what my value is becoming, and I can actually monitor if it's actually picking up the right thing. So if I want to, let's just go here, I'll delete all this and grab the distance. I can see that that object and the camera are 3,004 apart, and then I can go in and just start playing with the position of this layer and make sure that that value is right, that it's corresponding appropriately. See what I'm saying? You don't necessarily get that if you're programming in the actual tint layer because it's all based on percentages. So that's just a little thing I just thought I would show you. So basically, back. let's go back on track, get back on track. I grab the camera Z position, the Z position of the layer itself, and then I create a distance variable, which is the Z position minus the camera Z position. So basically figure out how far away the camera is from the layer. And then I grab my near value and my far value and my intensity. And those are just the sliders that I define up at the top. And those will be called basically they'd be my global environment settings. So this, I want this the same for every single layer because I want to be able to set the near and far value. If I want the fog to, to, to diminish or get more intense or even to change color, I want this all to happen from one place. I don't want to have to go back in on each layer and do this. And then the next thing I grab is the I create the fog range. And the range is is basically the far minus the near. And that's telling me how much... Uh, Z space the fog takes up. So if I subtract, let's say my far here up here is 8,000 and my near is 1,000. Well, let's just do the math. 8,000 minus 1,000 is 7,000. So the range that the fog covers is 7,000 units, right? So once I have the fog range, I now want to get a percentage of wh what is the percentage of distance minus the percentage that the camera's distance is with the fog layer itself because you want it's this weird thing like if you want to get the percentage that a value is of another value you have to divide the smaller value by the big value i know it's a little weird but it's like in in high school when you're like they're they're saying like what is what it, um what percentage of a thousand is 30 right and you don't go 30 into 1,000. You go, how many times does 1,000 go into 30? And that will give you a decimal point number. And then you multiply that by 100. And that gives you the percentage, right? So basically, that's what I'm doing. I'm taking the distance divided by the range. And then I'm multiplying it by 100. Um, the reason I'm subtracting near from it is because I want to take off the value of where the fog starts. I don't know if that makes sense. Like. If the fog was starting right at the camera, we wouldn't worry about this, but I've got this near value, and that means I don't want the fog to kick in until it's in the frame a little bit. So if my near value is at 1,000, I'm basically adding that 1,000, or I'm, I'm, putting that, I'm including that 1,000 from the distance, if that makes sense, um, or taking it off the distance. It's, I'm removing it from the equation because I, I don't want to include it in there. So anyways... It's a little bit weird, but this it does work. So um, I'm not explaining this very well, but it does work. So we take the distance minus the near, which gives us the overall range. It kind of gives us the distance that the cameras, the camera and the object are existing within the fog range, which is like how much space it takes up. And then that gives us a percentage. So dividing distance minus near divided by fog range gives us a percentage, like a, a point to decimal value. And then we multiply that by 100 to get the percentage. So I'll just show you what that looks like. Let's get rid of, oh, actually, let's do this in the, val um, oops. Let's take this and do it in the little value slider so you can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> go down, down we go. So let's just take the distance fog range. I'll get rid of this times 100. And you'll see I'm getting a decimal, 0.29, right? 
So what we want to do for that is multiply that by 100, and that will give us 28.63%, basically. So, and I'm only doing that because the the fog tint has to deal in a percent value, right? Because it's between 0 and 100%. So now if the camera moves close, the percent should go down. And if it moves further away, the percent should go up. Now, it took me a while to figure out this exact like setup. It took me a bit of walking around and drawing a picture to really think about it. Um, so then I have this. And the next step is to, I have what I'm calling an intensity. So then I multiply this whole thing by intensity. And that's just, that's, a, that's essentially just a multiplier, right? So that means if I want, if I'm way up here in the actual scene and I want my fog to be more intense, I increase the intensity. So that means things are going to get to 100% faster. Now this is just a linear relationship. This isn't like a complex fog system where you can have like a quadratic fall off or anything. It's not taking any logarithmic values or assigned value. I don't know the actual, but it's not doing anything like that. It's really linear. So it's not realistic fog. There is a plugin that I do use sometimes for realistic fog and it's called, um, what is it called? It may not be on this computer. No, it should be on this computer. It's, uh, it's this one. Um, let's just grab the effect. I'll find it. It's a really good one because this, this actual, um, where are they? It's called depth Q or something. Oh, Buena. I think it's Buena depth Q. This one, you can do the same thing. You can create a depth layer and get, get create fog and atmosphere and stuff like that. And it will even calculate, because it's more per pixel, I think. So if you have a layer and it's angled towards the camera, the, the amount of tint is based on where, like you will have a ground plane. Let's say if you have a flat layer, you can create a distance, like a fog that goes across the ground plane. You can't do it with this technique because this technique here, it's really basic. And it doesn't take into account the fact that if this layer is, let's say we scale this layer up to like to a billion, it's so super huge and it was like a jet plane runway or something, and you rotated it like this, we're basing the tent level on its position in space, not on the edges of where it is. So the, the Buena depth cue will actually fade something properly based if it's rotated or not, beca but because we're doing really basic animation, it's not necessary to use that plugin. And that plugin can be a little bit heavy at times. So anyways, so now that I've I've figured this this little thing out, basically all I have to do, the next step is we've applied it to the tint, like this fog tint here. We've got the amount applied to it. And then the other thing is is to link the color values here to the little tint driver up here. So basically I, I let's just we'll just, just disable this. I basically take map white too and then I bring it up here and grab it here. And this is so that every, if I decide to make this ridiculous color, all of the layers will be changed that way so that there's one driver and the rest just follow suit. So I should be able to now just copy and paste this tint. Actually, I'll rename it. We'll call it Fog Tint uh, CNT for controller. Oops. Fog Tint. Wow, great. I spelled like so good there fog tint controller cool and now i can take that and i'll just copy i'll grab one of these pale layers mm, actually i don't even need to i'm just going to grab this i'll copy this and then i'm going to go into the forest set and just paste it up there just underneath the camera so this will be my fog tint controller and then now i can just take this tint effect here and copy the tint effect and paste it on my objects. Bonk. Now the hope is on this big tree, this one shouldn't do anything. But let's see if we go. Dun dun dun. If we go near slider is zero, we should start seeing it. And we can fade that up or down. So what this will start doing, obviously, is if I grab this this whole tint effect here um, on the big tree, and I start pasting it onto like different layers of trees. So let's just go down here, grab some of these f background layers. Let's see, are these bushes even visible? No, they're not. Come on. So if you press control in the down arrow, you can just cycle through layers. So we have this layer. I'll paste it. 
and the trees will turn white. And so what that, that means is that I can start controlling the depth really easily. This works really great if your camera is moving forward in space, which is awesome. So if you want to like do a scene where you're moving through a forest and you want the depth to the color to change as you move your camera and you want you don't want to have to keyframe everything, this works really great for that. I use this this little technique all the time. This is the first time I've actually made the code more efficient and nice. Um, and the other thing is, is obviously I'm not going to push I'm not going to push it to white. I would typically select a sky color. You know, I can select any colors that I want um, and just push it that way. So maybe as things get further back, I want them to be a little bit warmer or maybe I want them to cool off. I, I can really push that effect around. Maybe I want to maintain the contrast. That's why I use a tint. So just in case I want to keep some of my contrast um, in the actual thing. Oops. Gives me a, a little more flexibility. Um, sorry, we should be mapping the black. Let's switch these colors. There we go. So anyways, that's that. Um, so I just thought I would stream that really quickly because I'm in the process of working on this. So the next step I have to do is go and uh, literally apply this and then really figure out what the best look for my depth is. So you can see I probably, to really get the fog right, would probably the best idea would be to map map it to this color here, which is the general sky color, and really reduce the intensity or increase the range. Like the other thing is maybe put it at one and our far, I think, let's see how far back that layer is. So I just have to scrub through here and look for this guy. Where are we? Bum, bum, bum. It's one of these guys around here. Sorry, I deselected it like a big dummy. This one. Its position is 3,099. Um, I guess I could just make it 3,100, 3,001, oops. 3,100, there we go. And the camera, I believe, is, is like negative 4,000 or something, or ne negative 3,800. So that's already a 6,000 range. Now we don't want that, I don't want 6,000 to be the absolute drop-off point for this, the solid point. I want it to be really the far, far background. And even then, I don't want it to be at full 100% because you'll see those trees I have in the fer very far background there. I want those to be probably the most um, tinted, but I don't want them to be 100%. So let's actually, maybe let's just do that. Let's go down here. Mm -hmm. We'll turn this effect off on this guy. This one doesn't even have an effect. I must be looking at the wrong layer. Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. There it is. I'm gonna copy this. Just delete it. So I want to go to my very far back layer, this forest layer. So this is just my little backdrop that I made. And I'll paste that effect onto it. And then now what I can do is just go up here and adjust the far. And I, oh yeah, and I want to see how far away that is. It's pretty far, I think. I think it's 8,000. Camera's at 4,000, so that's a 12,000. Minus whatever our near would be, which I think our near should be about 1,000 possibly 500 we can change that so sorry that was again that was negative 4,000 roughly 8,000 so that's 12,000 minus that so it's 11,000 for the for the far roughly and that should bring us where the color is 100% well it's not going down now I could have done something wrong in the code where I'm not we'll see I'm not an expert so sometimes I do stuff that doesn't 100% work Okay, I want. I'm just keeping the intensity up so that we do have 100% fog capacity. I'll turn it down as we experiment. So let's just put it like that. And now, this may be horrible. This may be a terrible idea. But I'm going to now take this. I'm going to save a backup first, really quick too. And then, oh, I'm also going to going to delete the trees I didn't use. I want to clean this comp up so I don't have so many layers to deal with. So I turned off trees that I w that were making the frame too cluttery. So now I'm in, I'm in a position of adding and removing, but what I want to do first is establish my, my depth and my lighting and then see 
what's too busy and what's not that way instead of trying to make it work really well with all this stuff going on because right now it's just so messy right um so we'll take this fog tint and i'll i can just paste it on literally on all this stuff and we'll start getting this whole effect here so it's just i'll just minimize everything um it might look pretty cool right off the bat, but it might also not. Now, the only other problem is, is I didn't take into account the fact that an object could be parented in my code. So that's something to consider too, is there's, there's a simple expression um, thing to say to don't, to look outside of the parent, like the absolute, absolute value of the thing. So that's not like what I showed you there is not a universal, um, it's not a universal thing because as soon as I parent something, it'll probably go all weird and won't work very well. So maybe I'm, let's just see, because I'm pretty sure it won't work because it's looking at a position value, a very specific position value. So if I take this forest thing here and I go layer new, I'm going to, I'm going to add a null object. I'll put that null object um, in 3D. I'll put it way back. Let's put it to 7,000. And if I parent this guy to it bonk my fog disappears yeah exactly hey co hey colin yeah two worlds should fix that so if i put i'm not worried about that for this specific thing um this specific one because well i mean i guess i could fix it um so i guess colin if you're here since you're here like i guess we could fix it so that it's a better example for people to use because i mean parenting is a is a fact of life um so let's just go back into this comp here. I'll save this. I can always recorrect the, the code after just by repasting it. Uh, if I go in here and we just want to change the the value. Do, 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 do. Oh, I'll change it in this one just so I can see what's going on. It should be right. So I guess when we're looking at Z position, um, Colin, would we want to go to world dot transform position. I can't remember how that actually, I don't know, remember the actual syntax. Let me just double check that uh, expression reference. Bring this down. Dun, dun, dun. Actually, another way to do it is um, if you go like this, I actually learned a lot this way. Uh, let's put this down here. And if you go into this little thing and you go property, I think, it might be global. No, um, it's in here somewhere. Comp. No. Uh, maybe it's vector. No. Space transforms. There we go. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the syntax is. So if we go to world, yeah, the transform position. Okay. Oh, thanks. And Colin, Colin just wrote it all out for me too, so I don't even have to use my brain. Um, da -da -da. So I'm just gonna copy what you pasted, Colin. Copy it here. So this one should be should be this right here. Two world transform position. So we're just telling it to everything in the brackets. We're telling it to look at it in world space. So that would mean not in relationship to, oh, anchor point, right? Yeah, don't forget. Yeah, two world has to work on the anchor point. So Colin just has a correction here. We'll just copy it. Thanks, Colin. That's awesome. So here, do you know why, Colin, do you know why it has to be anchor point? What is the specific reason that it's fo you focus on the anchor point and not the actual position? Okay, so that should work. It didn't damage anything, so it looks like everything's still working. So let's just double check. We'll double check two things. Is we'll take its position and slide it forward and backwards. Okay, that works still. And then, so the next the next thing would be to parent it to something which we can just parent it to another one of these. Make this one green. I'll move it off to the side. Okay. 
Uh, so Colin's saying it transforms the point from its layer space. Okay, and I and I guess layer space would be the local space that exists in that layer versus um, in the world. I, mean, is that, I always find that stuff a little bit, messes my mind a little bit, especially when you're going to world and then you have, just like when we were doing that, the null object where another null object drives something in another composition when you go like to world and then like L, the L thing where you take a layer and you, you take the layer's value and you put it into world space and then you grab it out of world space and put it back into the local space. I always find that stuff a little bit messes with my brain a bit. Okay, so now I'm just going to do that. This shouldn't change, but it did. Why did that change? Oh, that's because I don't have it on the tint, but it didn't change in the value. So you see this slider value here? When I parent it, it doesn't. that value doesn't change. So I can just translate this, grab this code from the value. Thanks, Colin. That's really helpful. You, you probably you saved me a bunch of time muddling through it. Um, whoops, I'm going to put this here. So that's just going to go in here. So now when we parent the object, oops, I did it wrong again. That should have worked because it worked on the slider. Why wouldn't it work on the tint? Because the slider didn't change. And Oh, because I did something wrong. I'm a dummy. I didn't even paste it in the thing properly. There we go. Sleeping on my feet. There we go. Cool. All right, so that works perfectly. So a uh, nice little correction from the community here. Colin, Colin Harvey, really big help. Um, he's a coder. He's been coding in After Effects for a while now. Really knows this. Uh, I don't know if you're he or she, sorry. Really knows their stuff. Okay, so I'm going to copy that, and now I can just paste that back in. So this here is the thing to use. Um, and I can put that back on this so that parenting shouldn't matter. So what I, I think I should be able to do is I should just be able to correct the code in one of these and then just recopy and paste it. Okay. So now I should be able to just take that tint, I'm hoping, and shift select all this stuff. Mm, I hope so. And just paste it. And it should have put the code the code in there. Yes, it did. Okay, cool. So we're all good. Awesome. So now, now what we can do is move our camera through. And you'll see it. Oh, actually, we can turn this off too. Um, and you'll see that the fog will change. Let's put it here and go in through the trees. Well, it's gonna it's going to be pretty subtle and slow, but I'm flying right through the middle of trees. Now we're lost in space. Anyways, it is working, um, and we can now start changing some of these values too. Is the density and the inten the intensity and the far and the near? We can put that near a little bit. I'd like to put the near further away from the camera, so that we're not tinting our close up stuff. But this this sort of this starts pushing things a little bit more, and it starts giving us a bit of that depth. We're not there 100% yet because my next step is to start putting in some ground fog and stuff like that. And this doesn't include lighting either, so we haven't gone in and started doing lighting or painting any shadows or anything like that. Oh, hey, hey, Spunrita. Um. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, this little this little bit of code is great, and it's really cool. There's a number of things it's good for. It's good for underwater scenes. So if you have like you're moving through water, I've used it before on water, um, so you can create haze. But then the other thing, you can attach it to an opacity value instead of an in intensity. You attach it to opacity, and you just reverse the value. So you can go times. Um, you just make it. You you make the relationship. You flip it. I'm not exactly, I can't remember exactly what it is to, to make it, because right now the percentage increases as you get further away. What you can do is make it so the percentage decreases as your camera gets closer. So if you have like a bunch of, what I've used in water before is textured layers, and, and the textured layers are creating all this like painterly texture. But what you don't want 
is you don't want to be flying your camera through stuff and having this like texture pop away because it's passed through the camera. So using this exact same technique and just changing your near and far values and tweaking those, you can make it so that layer's 100% opaque, 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 and then fades down just bef before the camera passes through it so you don't get that weird popping. So you can add all this like really cool texture to, to bring a bunch of volume to the air and then and still have a, a, a truck in and not ruin the whole thing. Okay, cool. Definitely, this having an effect on every single layer is definitely increasing my render time to preview a layer. It could be because there's so much code on every single layer, like it's, or that I have, well, let's just have a look. Code does slow things down sometimes. So what I might do um, while I'm just while I I'm putting all my little my little fog layers in is I might turn that code off for a little while. There's probably like a better way to write it so that it's not so heavy. Um, it could be the code or it could be the effect itself. It's probably it's probably the code. Probably something I did is it's making maybe I have too many variables. Um, maybe I made too many values. Like it doesn't, it's not a big problem, but code can even slow down a render. So that's definitely something to think about. But so I may have too many things. Like there's probably a way to optimize it a bit better. Um, Spun, Spun Reed is saying that it's awesome that that all this time they've been manually reducing the opacity of smoke and fog layers. Yeah, me too. I used to do that a lot and it drove me crazy. And then you would like be like, this camera move needs to be 15 seconds instead of 12 seconds. And then you just have to redo everything. Okay. Actually, it's working better now. Or is it? Yeah, it seems to be. Weird. There was just something funny going on there. Okay. So now um, I'm just going to – I'll quickly show what my next step is, and then we can go from there. Oh, one other cool thing too is the, the nice thing about this is let's say um, I want the haze to change. This is like – this is why I make a, a source because what I feel like in this shot is by the time I'm up here, this fog looks a little bit nicer, right? It's, it's sort of a warm day fog. Um, and then down here though, I kind of want it to be dark and cool, cold and more spooky, like the forest to be in a kind of a, a cool tone. So what I can do is because I've created this stuff up here, I can just animate the color of this on this um, on this layer. So as we move through, as we, we can come out of the dark, the cool fog. So let's just see if I can get, I'm just riffing right now. So I could make this look like garbage. Um, I don't know for sure, but what I could do is go into more of like a cool, cool darks like push everything in the forest to darker colors see to make that forest a bit darker and spookier let's put the blacks to like a greenish color that's probably gonna look garbage but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep figuring it out plus we can animate the density I'm just gonna figure out what color is gonna be best. Um, yeah, and then so also we can animate the intensity value, which is cool, and then the near and far scalers. These guys can be animated. So we'll animate those, and then we'll have them more to these values as we come out of that part of the forest. Dude. So here, maybe I'll make my intensity higher might be too much it looks garbage right now the color is wrong so it doesn't look good and then maybe i'll change the far slider down to you know let's try 20 and get the near closer so that more of the forest is affected and it's just this color is bad it's not a good color that looks a little better and then now once we get our lighting our lighting popped in there and stuff, it'll look a little bit better. But we will just see as we transition. So maybe I'll render this out really quick. 
So we have sort of this hazy bluish color. And then it'll gradually transition to like a lighter, lighter yellows and stuff like that. Ooh, if it renders, this is pretty big. Like this is a, like a, it's a 4k composition. I'm rendering at a quarter. So it'd be the equivalent of rendering HD at half resolution. So it's a bit slow. Like this is, and again, the composition is 12,000 pixels. The, the original artwork is really quite huge. So I have a pretty good computer processing this. I wouldn't recommend a scene this. Like if, if I had a slower computer, what I would do is I would have made my key layers smaller. Um, I would have made more layers that weren't so big. Um, you know, like made them like 3,000 by 2,000, uh, maximum 6,000, and just sort of put it together that way a little more manually instead of sometimes some of the layers I have are like, you know, 10,000 layer, 10,000 pixels wide by 4,000. That's a lot to stick in memory. And that's a lot for the computer to process. Uh, I still have some lighting work to like coloring work to do. Like see this tree here is really, really dark. So what I have been doing is I've been going in and fixing some of the colors and I, I'm trying to do as much in After Effects as possible without having to go back into Photoshop and recolor layers or, or create new versions of trees and push the colors different ways. I'm hoping that once I get my lights in, things will look better, but there's also the risk it'll just look worse. So the first step for me is to add amp, uh, atmosphere, which we just did. And then the next step is to add some of my little hazy smoke layers that I have and just use those to manually push the haze where I want it to be to create simplicity where I need it. And then the next step is to start playing with lighting and and hopefully that will help. And then the last step, once I've established lighting and the general ambience, is that to then go into each layer. Well, it's not the last step. It's, it's to paint some shadows. Like you can see I've already painted some shadows on some of these where you can see they've, they and that's that was actually in the painting itself. So some of these were already painted in, but there's only so much you can do. Um, so here you'll see a pretty non intrusive transition from a cool, a kind of a cool blue colors to like a warmer color. So this feels like there's a dark forest in there somewhere. And then come on computer. And then it's transitioning to this warmer light as we come out of it. It's pretty cool. I think it actually, it's already working a lot better. Sweet. I'm pretty happy with it actually. I think it's going to look really good once we get some lights in there. Yeah, and that's just um that's just a simple little piece of code on a tint. And atmosphere makes all the difference. Uh yeah, so Spun Reader um is just saying I'd love to see how you paint shadows with an AE. Uh, it's not you know what the problem is is there's probably a plugin that deals with this cuz I hate I am not happy with how after effects forces you to paint on a layer like i feel like i should be able to just let's say like let's go for instance i'm just going to save this really quick i'll purge out the the memory possibly that's only two gig that's fine we'll leave it so i'm going to just we'll just take an obvious one for instance like one of these ground layers okay so i have this one and this one this middle one and this one this one's like a so let's just put these three together. So what I wish you could do in After Effects is just grab your paintbrush and just paint on a layer, but that doesn't exist. Um, there may be a plugin on AE Scripts or something that can do that, and I, maybe we can check that out because that is something that would be a huge mega mega time saver. Because right now what I have to do is let's say okay, let's say I want to paint this shadow of this tree. This one, let's say it's a dark tree and it's kind of casting a shadow across this whole thing and we want to put a little shadow there. Um, well, the, the easiest way I can do it without creating a light source. Okay, Colin is saying there's a paint and stick thinks does that. So let's, I want to check that out. First, I'm going to show you the way, the manual way that I do it, which makes my life miserable, which is more like what's, what Spun Rita was saying about turning on, on and off opacities and animating opacities. And maybe there's a plugin that's going to make life beautiful again. So normally what I'll do is I'll actually go in, set it to constant, go right back to the beginning, and I'll paint a shadow. This is hideous right now, but I'm just doing a really quick example. And then 
you can go into the effect and then just adjust. So this is like a last step for me because I'm not doing this unless everything else is working really well. And then I can sort of, I can play with this this brush a little bit and I can I can start tweaking it. I can drop its opacity down and get some shadows. And I'll usually make the color not black. I'll make it like an actual color, like either a bluish color or whatever the ambient. So you want to push your ambient, whatever the ambient tone is of the space. And then I'm just trying to remember what the... Mm, oh, right. And I'm just want to... It's saying I'm painting alpha. I want to just paint RGB. And I want it to be a multiply I think I don't know if I can change that I might just have to leave the color there are compos compositing options for that but I don't really so I'm just gonna make it a nice dark color so this as you can see is a fairly primitive and difficult way to go about it but it does work let's check out really quick since since Colin brought it up let's check out paint and stick I want to see if this thing will actually work for us. AE script scripts. I'm just typing it in right now, and then I'll I'll bring the screen down. Calm. <laughs> so I got this. I don't want to log in yet. I just want to look for paint and stick and see if it's there. <laughs> Oh, Colin already found it. Stick live comps. Paint directly in a comp with your custom Photoshop brush plus onion skinning. Awesome. That's exactly what we're looking for. I have the sound turned off and everything. I don't know if you guys can hear this or not. Oh, you know what? Wait a minute. I think I know the guy who made this. Does this, though, does this work on... Oh, it does. Okay. Because it also works with normal maps. Like that, this 3D guy you're just looking at, that's a normal map render that you can do out of a 3D program, which then can allow you to paint right onto... Like this guy is just adding a face onto it. This is really cool, actually, by the way. This is... I'm pretty, I wonder if Migdad made this. Yeah, so I want to get this thing for sure. That's fantastic. Man, that thing's so cool. I wonder though, can I still, can I, so this is letting me paint onto a 3D rendered object, right? Will it let me, well, it looks like he has some, let's have a look. That's a 3D example. I want to see a 2D example where we can paint directly onto a comp. Oh, is it further down, Colin? Oh, here we go. Wow. This is great. Man, this plugin's crazy. Yeah, this would be really helpful for painting shadows and stuff like that. This is really cool. Man, I wish I would have thought to use this forever ago. I thought that this was strictly for 3D objects like this, like 3D compositing. I did not realize you could do it on 2D as well, and it would actually do nested comps. Like, that's super cool. Um, cool. Um, let's see here. I won't, I won't get into this thing right now. Oops. Why did I go there? Sorry guys. Um, I won't get into this thing right now, but I definitely will pull this in. Who made this? Cool. This is awesome. Great. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks Colin. Once again, saving the day. One one uh, one comment at a time. 
cool. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to definitely I'll try this one and grab it for sure. That'll help with the shadows. So I don't have to worry so much about fighting with those shadows. It is 99 bucks, but um as, you know, we're we're a little studio here, so it's not it's not prohibitive cost prohibitive for us. That's a great value for the cost. Um but I I I do realize that not everyone can afford that. But that being said, you know, those are what the, then you have to just deal with what's under the hood of After Effects, which is the, unfortunately, the more manual process, which can be very frustrating. Um, so right now I'm just fixing this tree because I feel like these trees are really too dark. They're sitting kind of in this cool um, dark realm, but something's happening. I probably have to purge out my RAM. Yeah, this is running super slow and chunky. Unless it's stuck. Yeah, that's what it did. It does that thing sometimes where my Cintiq, it doesn't let go of the... It wants to, so I'll just purge this out. I'm not sure why that happens. So I want to just tone down the blue on... There's a blue lit edge on those trees. I'll probably isolate them here. Okay, and I'm going to turn this fog off for now so I can just look at them on their own. Bring their contrast up a little bit. And I want to kill off that blue in the bright zone. So I'm just going to pull a little bit of blue out of the highlight area just to warm those trees up. Mm, let's just pull it. We'll pull it all the way out. Like So this, what this will do is this gets the trees, because these trees were originally designed to span the whole thing, and they go from a cool to a warm. But what I did... As I broke the whole thing up, so you can see that's the actual thing here, and these trees go from this kind of more of a cool space to a warm space because they were designed to work across the whole scene, but it didn't quite work that way. So I've had to modularize them and, and cut them apart, which means I then have to modify how they how they look, and treat the colors a little bit. I might bring a little more red into them. Cool. It might be too red now, but let's just have a look and see if they sit a little bit better. Put the tint back on. I should probably do the curves before the tint, actually. So I don't want I don't want to push on top of the fog. I want to push underneath it. So that's warmed them up a lot, so they they don't feel so wrong like these cold little gray objects in the middle. I think they just need they're probably a little bit too bright now. So I'll just pull this bump down a little bit. Cool, I think that looks lots better. Yeah, see that? So the, those are really gray and cool. And with where they're situated, because there's a bit of this clearing, so I pulled out some of the big trees, and there's all this light pooling right here. I want to keep them a bit warmer. Okay, I really do have to work on my light zoning, though, because right now, if I squint, things are pretty messy. Like, there's just stuff all over the place. It's It's kind of like an explosion of brights and darks and cools and warms so that's probably that's where the fog stuff comes in and then we're manually managing some of these layers like these foreground trees here stuff like that will come in important or like these guys maybe darkening these or lightening these guys up or increasing the fog density as we come up here there's a lot of stuff to do it it's going to take a bit of tweaking to make this work Um, but yeah, I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna stop streaming pretty quick here, because um, I just wanted to do that quick thing based on just a couple of these little tips and stuff, um, and then let that video be a an ex a little thing that exists on Twitch that I can post up to YouTube, uh, and then and then I'll come back on after I've done a little more work in here and I figured it out because I got I got to kind of wrap my brain around what I'm going to do to try to resolve some of these issues, and then I, when I'm done, I can just pop back on and show how I solved them. And then that way it won't be so tedious. Um, and then from there, and I might like I might start playing with lighting a bit first, so I can get something that looks good, because that can be quite time consuming as well. Um, lights add a lot of complexity, and they also slow rendering down. So it's like if you don't have to use them, sometimes it's better not to. Um, and I find for me. 
Uh, usually I default with like one amp, like an ambient light for a general atmosphere. And then I start doing like zoned point lights because for some reason for me, I don't know if other people have this problem, but um, if I try to use a parallel light, which is more like sunlight, it, it destroys my computer every time. I've never had it work. And maybe it's because I only ever try to do it once I have these insanely complicated scenes. But I've never got it to work right. I've always had parallel lights destroy my computer. So that looks horrible, for sure. Because that's an ambient light. So I just turn this to a point light. You could do a spotlight, too. And that yellow is awful. It really needs to be warmed up a little bit. I just said I wouldn't do this, and now I'm doing it. I'm a terrible person. Okay. So right now, by default, After Effects doesn't cast shadows. You have to tell things to cast shadows. But you can see already, I just thought I would do this, because in my head, I'm, in my guts, I'm having a, like, tiny panic attack about how how um, busy everything's looking and it's stressing me out a bit um, but so what I wanted to do is be able to come in here and start creating that depth that really helps pull the scene apart more like an animated film you know like in Disney films where like the foreground stuff is really dark you know it's a bit of a cliche but it definitely works so with this with the light and making sure that the fall off is appropriate and stuff like that uh, let's see what is our fall off our radius is a thousand, or no? Was that ten thousand? I think it's ten thousand. I think I can drop that down. Maybe we'll see. Well, no, it makes the background too dark. So that's the the thing to play with is the radius for sure, because we don't want if we have this light, for instance, like this light is pretty warm at the moment. So maybe down here, we kind of want more of a, I don't know, like a cool light. Maybe a little more green in it because it's maybe it's the light from the canopy. Ugh, that's hideous. That's gonna be so ugly. We need to desaturate. It's bad news. There's a whole lot of bad news happening there. We'll move it more into those kind of warmer greens. As much as I like it, cool. It looks a little pukey right now, so we definitely there's gonna be some color. Maybe I have to do it more in the purples or something. I'm not a master of lighting and stuff. I, I really do fumble through. I'm Mr. Fumble Pant. Like, I just fumble through everything, pretty much. Mm -mm -mm. Purple is definitely better. Pink's, no, pink is too nice. Like, I'm trying to make it a little, I want the forest to start out a bit, like, dark, because this is the first shot you see of this section, right? So I'd like to start with cools. And this is how I relit those other scenes in... The other animation that um, I did here, this one, I this is the first lighting pass. And then what I did was, this is all redone with lighting. So I didn't retint, and it's done with the same fog thing. So I have the fog on this one, and I was pushing the color of the fog and then changing the lights in the scene. So there's a whole bunch of lights inside the shed because that's a, a 3D object that's done in um, using Element. I hate that shed door. It makes my gut sick. I don't, I don't even like looking at it. Um, but but the environment itself is lit by a few, just a few point lights. And so I push the values of those point lights, or the, the colors or the hue of them and the value of them to create the, the nighttime scene and then to to do the, 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 the this scene, which is more neutral. And then this one is like a warmer morning scene, right? So I was able to just move the lights around and make the artwork pop a little more. So that's that. But as you can see, I'm already getting some sweet results, I think. Um, and I'm using one light right now. Um, the thing is, is I think this light might be too wide. It's probably too big. So because I want, as I get up here, well, it does start getting trailering off a little bit. But it is pretty, it's 10,000 radius. So it's probably too high of a radius. But um, I'm going to call this forest start. Okay, and then I'll duplicate this, which make everything look horrible. Bring this way over here. And bring it up. This process is definitely 
you know, it's a good way to, to go if, um, to create some quick depth without having to retint every single layer. Um, so this one I would make warmer because I want it to feel like nice, nicer anyway. Oh, hey, douchey. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Your name's, your name's hilarious. How goes? Mm, there's something really rotten happening in the background here. I'm not sure what it is. Probably something I'm doing. Oh, you know what it is? I forgot to do something. Make sure your far background layer doesn't accept lights. So don't accept lights. Don't accept. Sh don't cast shadows. Don't do any of that. That's important for your skies because they're always they should be impervious to light sources. Um, and I think now what I'm dealing with is a little too much range on the cool light. They're both polluting each other, making this weird gross palette that I don't like. So I, I definitely have to change the, um, um, I have to change the, the, the range of these guys, the radius. So let's go, uh, I'll just bring it to, let's just half it for now, even though it's going to wreck some stuff. Like it'll make this forest in the back too dark, but I could probably add another light. And then I'm going to, going to do the same thing for this one. And we'll just add more lights as we need them. Cool. Now that rock there, I'm probably going to have to paint that little rock because that rock is so white, it's sticking out really badly. And I'm not sure what that layer is, but I'll find that later. We'll clean that up. Okay. And I think at the end, I might just increase the density a bit. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. And that's probably the intensity is probably way too much because we got to remember that we have an ambient light as well. So usually what I try to do is whatever the intensity of the ambient light is, I try not to stack too much on top of it. So let's just have a look. This is this is without lights and with lights. So I really want the lights mostly to affect color and foreground value for this specific example. So when I turn it on and off, I think it's looking pretty cool. It's definitely helped this part of the forest. Um, I'll probably put... Oh, that's end. We want this one. I'm going to put another one of these lights in further in. Over here more. Okay. I just don't want that far background to be completely dark. Oops, probably should lock that layer so I don't wreck what I did. Anyways, this process is a little, you know, it's a little back and forth, kind of tweaky and stuff like that. Oh, thanks, Kira. Kira says it's very lovely. Uh, I appreciate that. It's really, really kind of you to say. Thank you. All right, so, and also... What did I'm this this is a confusing name start end this should be forest end. Um, I'm also going to put a light in the foreground. So let's just call this F G L T. My naming is awful right now. I'm I'm just riffing. I kind I did not plan to do this. I was planning on stopping the stream and now I just got carried away again. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this light back behind the camera. Okay, and this I can use to help help color color the foreground stuff a little bit. So without it, we get quite extreme darks. And with it, we've cooled, them off, cooled off the foreground a bit. And we haven't lost all of, our, all of our values and colors. Now this is getting really grayed out. So there's something not good there, that little patch right in the middle. But that could actually just be the layer itself. 
Because remember, if you mix oranges with gr with blues, they gray out. Uh, it's kind of just a green. It's quite gray. Um, I'm going to make sure I call this ambient. So the ambient light is probably too blue. Uh, I think what I want to do with the ambient light is actually make it the same color of the sky. But this part of the sky that's more of a bluish tint and not, not the yellow part of the sky. So the sky has a couple of different colors. It has this all the way, and it's just, it's more of a reference than anything. But let's take um, maybe a bit more of the ambient light would be more that, well, it looks like I've already pretty close to what it is anyway. It's almost a gray. It's really, there's not a lot of color to it. I want to be careful not to overcolor it. It might even be better just as a white. It's really hard to say. This process can take a little bit, quite a bit of time, the lighting process. So there we have the ambient light. And that just flattens things out because it lights everything equally. And then we just put these guys back on. So that layer, I really don't like this, this washed out white thing that's in the front there. I like some of the other stuff that's going on. It looks really cool. But there's a couple layers that are garbagey looking that make my guts angry. So I'm definitely going to want to fix those wherever they are. This guy, no. It's behind you. There's a culprit in here somewhere. I know it. Where are you? Okay, you're even further down. Let's try this one. That's the one. Yuck. What is your problem? Okay. This is just really gray. Now, I just want to make sure, because I did cut these a lot of these layers up. Does that part show? I think it does. So what I'm probably going to do is, because I don't mind its coloring here, although it still is fairly desaturated, which could be a bit of a problem. But I definitely want to potentially, not definitely, potentially, um, cut this layer in half. Because, well, we'll see what happens. Um, I want to increase the saturation here and play with the brightness. And now the fog tint, that's good. It's happening on this. Color balance. Um, and then the curves, which, goodness sakes. So I'm just going to turn off this a bit. I think I'm desaturating it because it was too saturated before. Man, that layer is just so ugly. I have to keep pushing that down even more. But that's really going to adversely affect. I may just have to chop that layer for that part of things because it's really it's just too washed out for this section and now it's just too green but the trouble with this is as I like so that it looks better like that but as we come here it's gonna going to look terrible see these are all supposed to be our nice little rocks and stuff and we've basically lost all of that so I definitely have to split this layer up I'll just undo everything. There we go. So they look good here. I like this. But they look horrible before that. So we need to cut this layer in half. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So we'll keep this half up here. And I'll just kind of... Well, let's just find a nice spot to cut in a little bit. Let's cut in around here. It's a pretty desaturated layer. But we'll just cut in like around here somewhere. I should probably go in here like this. Yeah, this was definitely not my most successful layer. I really struggled with this layer, and there was one other layer I really struggled with. Okay, fading that out. Good. Um... Now, did I forget to duplicate? I didn't duplicate it yet. So we'll have that one, and then we'll duplicate this. And I'm just going to tuck it in just a bit. 
negative 900. And on this one, we'll take the mask and I'll just make a new one. I, I could just reverse the mask. Well, I guess I can just reverse it and just put it more like this. I just want to make sure there's some overlap there. And then I'll just take this mask and subtract it away. There we go. So now I can isolate this layer out. Maybe let's bring it, give it a little more. There we go. Cool. Now I can isolate this layer out and color it a little more appropriately. Cool. And there you can see them overlapping. So over here, we can eliminate the gray washed out feeling of that. It's mostly, it's not so much the color that's a problem, it's the value, at least in my head. Like that is way too bright. It looks like there's moonlight shining right on it. So this one is, is problematic. So I'm going to turn off this. Let's make sure on this one, fog tint is enabled because that was all, I think that one was working fine. It's just more this guy. It's just a big white patch. And I might even take its saturation, just using the most basic. It's probably way too much. And those greens are getting a little bit stark, but. Yeah, I'm making islands. Hey, Theros. Welcome to the stream. This stream was not meant to be like th this out of hand, but now we're on we're on this we're on this crazy bender of making stuff okay so that's pretty extreme those colors are kind of crazy so let's bring the saturation down mm, maybe I'll just kill it all together it's very blue and very cool but I might just use a tint on this thing because I don't have a lot of control over this because it's so dark and there's that offensive little white rock this was a bad layer for sure I'm not happy with this layer Let's also try, maybe we can push this into more like that. I mean, all by itself, it's not bad. It's just how it works with everything else is a bit horrifying. It's still not good. It's still very offensive to, m to me anyway. I want to fight it. Uh, wrestle this thing down. Oh, thanks, Thoreau's. Uh, Thoreau's saying the bike turned out cool. Watch the replay. Yeah, it's coming along. Um, I'm going to work on I have to do the cyclist tonight. I have to work on that. So I'll definitely stream the cyclist when I get to that, that stage. That's not horrible. I'm not a huge, biggest fan of the colors, honestly. But let's just see what the fog tint is doing. It's more, I do need to nail some contrast. I feel like it needs to be even darker so maybe let's just do this I may ultimately resort to a tint push and shift on it okay let's see how it looks with no lights on because the only reason I want to check is if if I make it look good with certain lights, but then it looks like garbage when it's the lights aren't on, then that means it's not going to work well if I change the lighting at all. I just want it to, to blend a little bit more with this some of the other layers here. I think I might just use a tritone tint on this thing. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, yes, we'll, I'll be rigging the cyclist. Um, Colin Harvey just asked, uh, rigging the cyclist. Yeah, um, I've got to rig the cyclist because this shot has to be essentially wrapped up by tomorrow night, the latest Tuesday morning. So I need to I need to wrap that guy up. We will try to grab some of these colors here.
right and don't forget I should be doing it before the curves I might push this like a bit into the oranges might be better let's just see if it's closer to the road colors I know that looks hideous at the moment but it might come together if we just darken that up a little bit or not oh you're right that should the yeah the script you did send that will be useful for sure um because that stuff's really helpful with with re character reading really struggling with this layer I'm just not sure what color to make it that's better to my eye oh, don't go too purple don't get cocky with it I just want to put a little more saturation into it and then take the black and push the blacks a little bit further down okay let's see what we have Yeah, hey Thoreau's, we, we have a atmospheric haze, but it's definitely turned down at the moment. We did a, when you check the stream out, we, we did a quick little, Colin actually helped me with a little script um, that will make the, it helps, it helps with the fog. It's like a little, we had a script going on. So it actually, it's a really cool, it's really cool and quick. I meant to stop the video before getting into this lighting stuff so that it could be a self-contained short video, but I've sort of ruined that at the moment. Well, I don't mind that. That's kind of cool. Um, it's sort of interesting. I'm not sure about it. This is weird. Uh, this layer is definitely causing me grief. I wonder if I just pull it right out. I could just get rid of it. Maybe it's silly to try to be hanging onto this layer that's not working very well. Mm, it definitely needs something. Well, I don't know. Does it need something? I don't know. This light patch is definitely not my favorite. So let's actually, I'm going to try to move it over because we barely see any of this layer in reality. It was always a consequence of trying to get those rocks from above in. Let's minimize the tint a little bit more. That's a bit better. I know this is making it pretty flat and neutral looking, but... and then pull this down a bit okay yeah this is this is the process I don't really want to have to expose you guys to honestly because this is just just can be just so utterly tedious mm. I'm really, the m thing I mostly need it for is to just help build a bit of depth in here and help the, the transition of colors between the road and the bushes. And a lot of this stuff I can only really do just by feeling it out. It's really hard for me just to know exactly what I need to do. And it doesn't need to be darker, it definitely... It just needs something. Maybe it doesn't have to be dark. I'm not sure. It's kind of like a little light patch in some ways. But also, that's too light. The The tricky thing is, is that unless we're like, we're very much in a mid-tone, so it, it disappears a little bit in the road. And unless we dip down below here, it's not contrasty enough to stick out against a lot of the road. Or we have to go above it. And then we have something where it sticks out. So it's really, it's kind of becoming a piece that's just being lost in there a little bit, which isn't a bad thing. 
There, I think that's a little better. I think I can live with that for now. And let's just try the light again. It's just, I don't want it to look as offensive. It, it just was really ugly before. I don't mind if it's a little bit ugly. It just, it was that bright gray spot it was making before it wasn't cool. It's now it's making this weird, I don't know, what is wrong with this layer? It's the fog tint. Okay, it's still, let's bring it down a little bit more. Maybe get rid of this. And this layer is just full of, it's got a little dash of hate in it for sure. Mm -hmm. Something about it that just doesn't work very well. It's this thing right here is just not doing it for me. I might move it over. Like that thing looks really ugly. So we can hide it. Now it's just, it's not really working. It's all gray blue now. I might just scrap this layer. <laughs> it was looking cool. Now it just looks kind of bad again. That doesn't look terrible now. Well, let's watch it a little bit. So thoroughs, we have, we do have some fog on it, but I toned it down a little bit. I think it's a little bit, it's also animated. Um, but it definitely needs more, we need more haze and stuff like that. We don't have, I don't actually have like my, I've not put in my cloud layers or anything like that yet. But I do have this fog. It's probably too saturated to be perfectly honest. Now that we have the lights going in there, it's just over blueing everything. It looks way too blue. Maybe it, I might just tone this down to a gray completely. And then in color correction, we'll push it a bit more. I don't know. We'll s I'll, I'm going to play with it. I have to play with it. That's a bit. Maybe it needs to be more green. There's a lot of, there's six definitely experimentation required because I don't like how black it's getting. Like there's this here is really not cool. And that could be because of this. No, not that. This one. Yeah, that's super black for some reason. Um, probably because like I don't know if I want to turn off the light acceptance 100% on this. Let's just have a look. Accept lights off. It doesn't look bad when the lights are accepting or off. But this area, it'll be too green. And it's, I don't know, I don't feel like it's working that well. This one I might also have to split into. Hmm. If we put lights back on and set its diffuse to 100, that should boost its lighting a bit. That's a bit better. So now it's more susceptible. It's more reactive to the lighting. But I do feel like here it's a little bit too dark. So I probably just need, I'll probably just need another light up here to brighten it up a little bit or increase the, the other option is, is to decrease the fall off distance for the here, the far point and bring it closer. Something like two, one, two, three. Oops, twenty, twenty thousand. I guess and then once we come up here, we can just thin it out more if we want to. I still think it's a little bit dark. I, I think like something I, I would like in future versions of After Effects would be nice is a certain level of material where you can almost fade the material option. 
Like, except lights, but only at 50%. That doesn't help. I definitely like that when it's really much brighter. So I'll probably put, oops, it's not what we want. I'll probably put um, just another light up here just to push that up a little bit. I'll push the diffuse up and I can, bu I can bump the specular up, but I want to be careful that it's not such a bizarre material setting that it is functions is completely bizarre compared to every everyone else unless it works through the whole scene let's try it here it's a little better i might add some more trees back there to break that shape up a bit okay mm i mean overall it's coming it's coming along so i gotta stop the stream because i gotta i got i want to break this video up and then come back on it here I'm just going to render this a bit and have a look at it. There's a couple of little outstanding parts that are gross, but I'm not going to worry too much until we get a little, I get a little bit more ground fog and stuff in. And then that from there, I'll, um, I'll start f dealing with the forest density and stuff like that. And the colors, there's still like problems all over the place. Like it's, that's the trouble with really dense trees and forests. These are always really tricky. Some scenes come together really fast and they look really good. Like I feel like the shed scene, this um this one came together really nicely. I'm really happy I'm pretty happy with how this one turned out. And it's it's just a good balance of trees and rocks and a couple big things and little things. It just worked out really well. Um and it came together really well, really quickly. But I find the scenes that I struggle the most on, they can they're not always my favorite, favorite. I'm trying to think. So that's this scene here, pretty much. The scene I, I really struggled with um, was probably, oops, this Russian section. I really struggled with this one. That took a long, 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 long time. And that was, uh, and it's still not great. Like, I'm not 100% happy with it. I think it's cool. Like, it worked out, considering for what it is, it worked out really well. But the painting is awful if you saw the actual painting it was awful and it took me a lot of work to hide how terrible the painting was and i'm just talking about this stuff while you render this one came together pretty quick this one was tricky i don't know if i've actually shown all this stuff finished i don't think i have um, but we'll definitely one of my plans is to go through and do a little post-mortem on all this stuff this these those train scenes came together really really quickly too generally Okay, let's get out of here. Oh, not this one. Desktop. There we go. Akira, is that is that really is that motherland? Is that your is that your motherland for real? It's in Russia. I'd actually really like to visit Russia. My friend went to Russia. But he only he went there to engineer, do some sound engineering for a show. Um, so he was only there for a few days. And I don't think he really experienced. I can't remember what city he was in. Um, what city are you in, Kira? Is it Kira? I I don't know how to pronounce that. It's probably not pronounced like that. I'm Englishifying that terribly. Canadianifying your name. I apologize for that. Okay. So I think. I guess what like when we're looking at this like once it's moving I'm happier with it it doesn't bug me as much when it's static it's definitely a bit hideous so we have to work on that okay uh, Kira you're you're in Moscow cool um yeah I don't I always wanted to visit Moscow I you guys do you guys have crazy winters like Canadians or is it even colder because I'm in I'm in Montreal and we get to the like, I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit but about minus 35 um, during the winter, and it's really humid because we have water all around us, so it's it's really cold. Um, so we get minus 35, but then in the summer we get 
plus as high as plus 35. We have a crazy temperature range. I'm curious about Russia, if Russia is even colder, longer than Canada, than in most of Canada, or is it about the same? I think you guys are on a similar parallel, or not parallel, like either longitude or latitude. I can never remember. Maybe it's the parallel. Um, anyways, I'd be interested to know, are you guys still cold? Are you finally getting warm? We're just starting to get our spring here in Montreal. Before this, I was working with gloves on. My house was freezing um all the time okay cool uh yeah so this needs a little bit of work but it's coming it's coming and then i'm going to drop a little so the bite the cyclist he'll be he'll be in this on this little road here bumping along and i guess really quickly before we shut everything down here i'm just going to ruin the whole thing by turning on chat oh actually no i'm not going to turn on shadows because in order for things, to, things by default in After Effects don't cache shadows. You have to turn them on. Um, I believe if I do this, it might just make a huge mess. I'm kind of nervous. I'm going to just like ruin this whole thing. I mean, it's easy enough to turn. Yeah, so shadows are generally pretty hideous. Um, you really got to be careful with shadows. And the thing about shadows in forest scenes, especially, I said this in another another uh, stream, is that uh, shadows don't aren't straight, right? So one of the problems with with a for with a forest is like everything's flat, right? So if your shadows are casting on this on, on what's supposed to be a bush and it's supposed to be a curved surface, that shadow should curve. But what happens is in After Effects, a shadow's super flat, so it doesn't work really well if you're um, unless you're going for that that kind of look, right? So let's just turn them off in this way. No shadows. It sometimes works. Like I definitely have some scenes where I've used shadows. Like I just did this train shot, which I'll show in in the next stream later on tonight. I did a train shot that used shadows. I I would say fairly effectively, um, but then other times it just doesn't work. Like this time, I, I would say it's not the best idea. Okay, and then we have this foreground light. I feel like where is that light? It's fine there. I'll probably need to do one. So fall off on this thing, 5,000. Okay, I'm not gonna start here. Also Kira is saying, uh, I was asking Kira about the weather. So it's various winter time. Moscow isn't too cold. May, may happen minus 30 during the night sometimes, but, but you were born in the very north of Russia on the Northern Ocean seaside, much colder. Yeah, that would be really cold. Yeah, minus 35 is really cold, and especially if you're on the seaside, is that humidity is murder. So it sounds like there's a similar, similar-ish weather for sure. Mm -mm. Okay, this is 50. Just checking up here really quickly if I need to add. I, I do need to add like a little foreground light here probably. So I'm just going to take this last light. Pull it over here. Um, one thing to maybe check is I want it around where the camera is right now, which I just look at the X values. It's 5600, 5689. So I'll just make sure that this... weird because it feels like okay that's fine and then it's at minus seven thousand it sounds like we could get closer okay, i want it around here i don't want it to affect the mid ground too much but the foreground mostly so i can drop its radius off here so you have three thousand okay and that should there we go around there all right so this one i just want to Warm this a little bit into more of the pinks, maybe. So let's see with it off. 
on. We just get back a bit of our values. It's kind of hard to tell if it's really doing much. I mean, it is. I mean, it's doing something, but I, I, w I also don't want it to do too much. And I don't want it to affect the mid-ground very much. I feel like it still is. Okay, now it's not affecting anything. Let's bring it closer. There we go. So that light has a much more isolated fall off on it, which is probably better. There we go. Yeah, frost and humidity is awful. I've actually been up to Echaluit a few times. Um, it gets pretty cold there, and they they that's like um, that's about a four hour flight north from Montreal, so it's quite north. Um, and apparently, they get these crazy snowstorms where people can get lost just outside the door of their house. And next thing you know, they just they disappear. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop this. Um, I think it's coming along. Like I said, uh, I think it's, it's getting better. We're getting a little bit more definition in the contrast. And so I think I just need to add a few more thin trees in, in that blue flat space right there. I don't like that. I, I need something in there to break that up a little bit. Um, just because right now it's just a flat shade. Um, and then I think the other thing I need to do is bring a few more little highlight spots. Like, things are a bit flat at the moment. And then, so the fog should help that. Um, and then we can, I don't know, like I, I, I was really looking forward to this scene, but I kind of, I feel like it's probably going to not be super amazing. Um, within the time I have, I could probably spend two more days tweaking this thing. So I think I just have to move along. It's just not going to be the shot I was hoping it would be. I thought it'd be like, it would be a super rad shot, but I think it's going to be just a, going to be just a sort of, a sort of rad shot. And those trees are looking a little bit dark. They're almost black. I mean, it's okay because like, forests have so much variety in them. Mm. There's a lot of, and that's a, like an organic scene like this. There's a lot of unpredictable light. So, okay, so this just feels a little too dark. So I might just take these guys and, although I'm not quite sure if they go, they probably go all the way up, don't they? Yes, they do. I'm going to just fog, always put the fog at the last effect, at least in my book, and bring up their light a bit. Oh, Kira, that's crazy. You couldn't open the door after a night snowstorm. We had a couple like that, not that bad. We had one like that this year. Uh, when I first moved to Montreal back in 2008, we had one where the snow was halfway up the door and you couldn't get out. But that's pretty rare. That's pretty rare out here. Okay, something's happened. Oh, it's lost the mouse again, as you can see. Yeah, see how that's happening? Like, I can only move this until I click with my mouse, then it lets go. It's doing it again. It's really annoying. So I'm not sure if I need to push the contrast on this. I want to be careful with that. I definitely want to brighten them up. They're sitting, they seem really quite dark. And that's possibly due to because of the lighting. Let's just turn off the lighting again. I probably should have a, a, a little expression linked up to the lights. Them being on and off, so I don't have to do this for every single one. That, that looks okay. I just want to make sure, again, like I said before, that I'm not blowing these trees out to a point where they don't fit in the scene with the lights off. Because... Also, sometimes what I, what I do is I might render one with a light, one with lights, and one without. And then mix them together. This could probably be... Okay, that's the light. Start light. Oh, jeez. Okay, that's a background one. 
Where's my end light? That's my end light here. I feel like this end light. Mm, we'll figure it out. Okay, I'm going to play with this stuff. All right, I'm stopping. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm going to keep working on this and get this looking better. And then I'll stream again this evening for anyone who's around. Um, I hope you guys have a good day. Thanks for hanging out. It's nice to nice to have all the good feedback. And thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks for your help calling on that little bit of code. That was awesome. Um, cool. All right. Well, I'll 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 be back online a little bit later tonight. I have no idea when exactly. So, if if you if you're around, then great. But if not, have a great Sunday. I'll see you. Do 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 do.